This is a production of Cornell University. So uh, thank you everyone um, for joining my talk. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Josh Garcia and I'm currently a fifth year PhD candidate um, here in the Department of Horticulture. Um, so I'm actually getting ready to graduate this summer. And so for today's horticulture seminar session, I'll um, kind of be taking a look back with you all and sharing a little bit about my PhD dissertation work. Um, and in addition, I'll also take a couple minutes to kind of talk about some of the other things I've been involved with as a PhD student um, and also talk a little bit about my next steps and kind of how it all comes together to sort of inform my goals and um, uh, goals going forward. Um, and so yeah, so thank you all again for being here. It's really great to see you all. And it really means a lot to me um, that you showed up to support. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, having um, this discussion with you all today. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I actually wanted to start off with my acknowledgments, just to make sure I had enough time to properly thank and acknowledge everyone. Um, so first and foremost, I wanted to thank my amazing dissertation committee, um, Jenny Gow Miffin, Jim Giovanoni, and Jed Sparks, for all of their amazing uh, mentorship and guidance throughout the whole PhD process. Um, I also wanted to thank all of my amazing lab mates in the Gown and lab, both past and present, um, for all of their help and support throughout the years and for just making our lab such a great place to work in. Um, I also wanted to thank some various friends and mentors of mine. So I'd like to thank Lynn Marie Johnson at the Cornell Statistical Consulting Unit for helping me out with the computational aspects of my work. I'd also like to thank Dr. Sarah Hernandez, the Associate Dean of uh, Inclusion and Student Engagement on campus for being such a great friend and mentor to me and other marginalized students on campus. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Dorena Samuel, who's the Associate Director for the Cornell Center for Teaching Innovation, for being one of my biggest teaching mentors and really helping me develop my teaching portfolio. I'd also like to thank um, one of my earliest mentors, Dr. Amelie Godin, um, who um, was the one who really inspired me to go into agricultural research. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Sarah Peralt, who's one of my nearest and dearest friends and mentors, um, who has helped me sort of navigate academia in so many different ways. Um, and I also wanted to give a special thank you to the UC Davis McNair Scholars Program. Uh, I always say without McNair, um, I probably wouldn't be in graduate school. So I wanna give a special thank you to everyone at McNair um, for believing in me, being invested in me, and also giving me the skills and confidence necessary to get to and complete graduate school. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge all of our different funding sources for this work that I'm gonna share with you all. So I'd like to thank the USDA NEPA grant as well as the NSF GRFP, um, the Atkinson Sustainable Biodiversity Fund and the McNair SUNY Diversity Fellowship. And so with that, we'll go ahead and get into the science. So what I study in my work are plant-associated microbiomes. And a microbiome, uh, for those of you that don't know or need a refresher, is just a collection of microbial cells in a given environment. Um, they're basically everywhere. They're on your chairs right now. They're up in the air. Um, you can find them out in the environment. Um, and you can also find them in and around plants. And in the case of plant microbiomes, all the different compartments of a plant, from the roots to the shoots to the leaves, all harbor taxonomically and functionally distinct microbiomes. And to kind of illustrate this, I have this figure from Gopal and Gupta 2016, which just shows all the different compartments of a plant and all the different microbiomes that are associated with these compartments. So we have the phylosphere microbiome, which consists of microbes that live on the leaves and stems of the plant. We have the endophytic microbiome, which consists of microbes that live within the plant tissue itself. And then we have the rhizosphere and soil microbiomes, which are the microbes that live in soil and interact with the plant via the plant roots. And so what I'm interested in looking at in my work specifically is the rhizosphere microbiome. And the rhizosphere, just to give a definition, is the area of soil that's under direct influence of a plant host. So it's basically a, sort of the soil interface that exists between a plant root and the bulk soil environment. And what makes the rhizosphere really interesting is that it's sort of this hot spot for biodiversity. And within the rhizosphere, you can find all sorts of organisms, including bacteria, archaea, fungi, viruses, worms, arthropods, basically everything. And with this really sort of rich biodiversity, there is the potential for a lot of complex ecological interactions to take place that actually influence various aspects of plant growth and development. And vice versa, the plant host also influences different aspects of the rhizosphere microbiome as well. And so for my dissertation, I had this sort of very broad overarching research question of how do microbial consortia in the rhizosphere influence horticultural crop traits and production? 
And my dissertation was a little unconventional in that rather than doing one big project, like I feel like dissertations typically are, I actually did four smaller projects, um, but all the projects are tangentially related to each other. They all sort of led to and fed into one another. Um, and again, they all go back to this sort of central research question that I have sketched out here. So to give you an overview of the dissertation chapters that I'm going to discuss in my presentation, um, I uh, have them sketched out here. Um, my chapter one was a literature review that we published in Frontiers of Microbiology. And in this review, we discussed the application of concepts and methodologies from other disciplines to rhizosphere microbiome research. And given that that chapter was just a literature review, um, I'm not really going to discuss it um, uh, in the rest of the presentation. Um, but again, it's um, published um, in Frontiers of Microbiology if you're interested in reading a little bit more about it. Um, my chapter two was a multi-generation growth chamber experiment where we were interested in promoting plant productivity in Brascarapa through an artificial group selection process. My chapter three um, was a greenhouse experiment that I worked on over at Boyce Thompson Institute. And in that project, we were interested in utilizing plant transcriptomics to understand how beneficial microbiomes alter tomato foliar and fruit traits. And then my final chapter was a field-based project that I received funding to complete from the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. And in that project, we were interested in understanding the effects of intercropping on soil properties in horticultural production systems. Um, so you see with all my dissertation chapters, you know, we're working with a lot of different plants, we're using, uh, we're working in a lot of different contexts and using a lot of sort of different research methodologies. Um, but again, all these different projects are going back to this central research question. And again, they all get at some sort of aspect of plant rhizosphere interactions. And so um, I'll start off by discussing my chapter two work. So my chapter two was again a multi-generation growth chamber experiment where we were interested in promoting plant productivity in brass carapa through an artificial group selection process. So to give a little bit of background and rationale for this experiment, what sort of motivated us to pursue this project was this idea of group selection. And group selection is this theory from evolutionary biology that states that natural selection can act on whole groups of organisms in addition to individuals as initially proposed by Darwin. And to kind of illustrate this, I have this figure um, from uh, my chapter one, actually, where we show all the different sort of biological levels associated with microbiomes. And what group selection theory states is that there are selective pressures at all these different sort of levels that are constantly interacting with one another and sort of counteracting one another to influence the observed phenotype type of a, of a microbial population. And so um, in the case of plants, we know that plants and their rhizosphere already do a sort of group selection-like pro processes. Um, and we know that when plants grow in stressful conditions, they can actually enrich their rhizosphere for microbial taxa that confer specific fitness advantages. And to illustrate this, I have um, this adapted figure from you at all 2021. On the left side, you can see a plant growing in nitrogen-limited soil. What it has the potential to do in this situation is actually enrich its rhizosphere via root exudation um, for microbial taxa that cycle nitrogen. And by enriching its rhizosphere for those microbes that um, do that specific activity, the plant then um, experiences enhanced uh, and uptake and just more broadly growth promotion. And so we know that again, plants are doing this sort of group selection in their rhizosphere already. And so for this experiment, what we wanted to see is if it's possible to sort of artificially select for whole groups of microbes that promote plant productivity and sort of engender this process um, artificially in a uh, controlled environment. And so for this experiment, we did a multi-generation selection experiment where we tried to develop microbiomes in the rhizosphere that enhanced um, plant productivity. So we first started off by gathering a single brass carapa seed pool, and then we planted an initial generation of these seeds in sterilized potting soil that was actually treated with a microbial inoculant created from organic farm soils. And then once we planted these seeds, we then assigned each pot to one of three random selection treatments. So we had a high biomass selection treatment where we tried to select for microbiomes that enhance productivity, and we used above ground biomass production as sort of our proxy for other aspects of plant productivity. We had a random selection line where we tried to select for random microbes, and that was to sort of control for our selection process. And then we had a non-adapted control line, which was not undergoing any sort of selection. And so we repeated the selection process for a total of nine generations. And then after each generation recorded plant phenotypes and microbial responses to try to look at what the effect of our different selection treatments were on microbial composition and plant phenotypes. 
And so I'll start off by talking about some of our plant phenotype data. So here we have plant phenotypes for generation nine, which was the final generation in the experiment after uh, microbiomes had undergone selection. And what was really interesting was that despite the fact that we were selecting for microbes that were associated with above ground biomass production, we didn't see um, enhanced biomass production in the high biomass selection line. But what was really interesting was that when we looked at other aspects of plant productivity, we did see some sort of interesting patterns emerge amongst the three different selection trees. So we have um, in figure A on the left side, we have seed yield, and you can see that seed yield is significantly greater in the high biomass selection treatment compared to the random con or the control treatment, while the random treatment doesn't differ between the other two. And then when we look at nitrogen agronomic use efficiency, which is defined as the gram of seed produced per the gram of nitrogen added, we see again a similar pattern emerge where nitrogen agronomic use efficiency is higher in the high biomass treatment compared to the control treatment, and the random treatment again doesn't differ between the other two. And so putting this phenotype data together, uh, what this all suggests is that, again, um, through our selection process, we maybe didn't alter above ground biomass production, but we may have altered these other aspects of plant productivity via our um, selection on the rhizosphere microbiome. And so in addition to the plant phenotyping, we also did some microbial analysis on microbial communities in the rhizosphere. So here um, I have our uh, ordination. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I wanted to take a minute to kind of explain what an ordination is and how we use them in rhizosphere uh, microbiome research. So what an ordination is, is a graphing method where you plot samples based off of community composition. And so each individual point that you're seeing on the plot represents a specific sample. And the, um, the way ordination works is that the closer two samples are together on the plot, the more alike in community composition they are. And the further two samples are from one another, the more dissimilar in community composition they are. And so in this ordination, we wanted to look at the effect of selection treatment and generation on microbial composition. We have our different selection treatments represented by different shapes. We have the high biomass treatment represented by circles, the random treatment represented by triangles, and the control treatment for all generation sequence represented by these aqua colored crosses. And then for the high biomass and random selection treatments, we have our different generations represented by these rainbow colors. And you can see that as the generations progress, we get sort of divergence in microbial community composition between the three different selection treatments, which was also verified um, using per, uh, quantitatively using Permanova, which you see on the upper left-hand side. You can see in our Permanova that there are um, sti uh, statistically, statistically significant effects of generation selection treatment and the interaction between the two on microbial composition. And so what this ordination is showing us is that through our selection process, we um, developed these unique microbial communities in these three different selection treatments, which again may help us explain some of the differences in Brassicarapa phenotype that we were seeing. And then to take our microbial analysis a step further, we also did some network modeling using extended local similarity analysis or ELSA. Um, and I won't get too technical with what an ELSA is, but basically what it is is a network modeling method that allows you to compare microbial interaction networks between treatments. And so for our ELSA, what we were interested in looking at was the effect of our selection treatment on microbial interactions. And you can see in figure A, we have our three different um, treatments uh, represented by these different colors interaction networks. And you can see just visually that there do appear to be some differences in interaction networks between the three treatments. And these differences become even more apparent when we overlay the networks on top of one another, which is what you see in figure B. More specifically, um, what I have circled there is a more dense microbial interaction network in the high biomass selection treatment compared to both the random and control treatments. And so what this is suggesting is that through our selection process, we not only developed these unique microbial communities taxonomically, we also altered microbial interaction networks and microbial activities. And that's really interesting from a rhizosphere microbiome standpoint, because it suggests that through our selection process, we developed these microbiomes that may be coordinating some sort of group level activities, such as plant growth promotion. And so to put it all together, what this data all suggests is that through our selection process, um, uh, again, our phenotype, shows, our phenotype data shows that we altered seed yield to nitrogen agronomic use efficiency in the high biomass selection treatment compared to the control treatment. Our sequencing data shows that bacterial community composition and interaction networks were both altered in response to selection. And these changes in uh, bacterial taxonomic composition and activity may help us explain some of the differences in plant phenotype that we were seeing. And so very broadly, this um, experiment's really interesting because it shows that 
through altering uh, microbial community composition and interaction networks, we can alter different plant traits. And so to go back to this uh, sort of central research question of, is it possible to artificially select for whole groups of microbes in the rhizosphere? Um, this data suggests that it is indeed um, a possibility. Um, and so that's my chapter two work. And so this project um, is, as Jenny mentioned, um, soon to be published in Communications Biology. Um, so hopefully within the next month or so, um, it'll be out if you're interested in reading a little bit more um, about this work. And so that was my chapter two work. And so now I wanted to move on to discussing my chapter three project. So again, my chapter three was a greenhouse experiment that I worked on over at Boyce Thompson Institute. And in this experiment, we were interested in utilizing plant transcriptomics to understand how beneficial microbiomes alter tomato foliar and fruit traits. So to give a little bit of rationale for this experiment, um, oftentimes when people study, want to study what the effect of a rhizosphere microbiome is on a plant host, um, they rely on phenotyping to sort of report what the effects of microbiomes are on specific plants, which isn't necessarily bad, but we know that microbiomes um, interact with plant hosts in a variety of different ways and can um, uh, alter plant phenotypes through a variety of different mechanisms that maybe aren't so evident through plant phenotyping alone. And so for this experiment, we wanted to sort of toy around with this idea of using molecular methods such as plant transcriptomics or RNA sequencing to sort of report how microbiomes are altering um, plant gene expression and um, developmental processes. Um, and so the microbiomes that we decided to work with in this experiment were derived from vermicompost. And vermicompost, for those of you that don't know, is just a soil amendment that's actually created from worm castings. And we decided to work with Burmese compost because previous research has shown that it has beneficial um, effects on tomato plant productivity, um, which is shown here in this picture that I have from a study that um, Dr. Neil Matson um, in our department actually did. And you can see that as we increase the percentage of Burmese compost in these tomato plants, we get consistently enhanced um, above ground biomass production um, in tomato. And so we know that vermi compost has this beneficial effects on um, tomato plants. And so for this experiment, we wanted to look at what the sort of microbial contributions to this growth promotion may be. And so for our overarching sort of research question or goal for this experiment, um, it was kind of two pronged. So first and foremost, we wanted to see again what the effect of microbes from vermi compost are on tomato traits. And then we also wanted to, again, see um, if it's possible to sort of use transcriptomics as a sort of method to look at what the effects of these microbiomes are. And so for this experiment, we, had done, uh, we again did a greenhouse um, trial where we grew tomato plants with one of three microbial inoculants and then looked at what their effect was on tomato plant phenotypes and transcriptomic profiles. So we planted tomato seedlings in the greenhouse and then treated them with one of three inoculants. We had a vermicompost microbial inoculant, which was a liquid microbial broth created from vermicompost. We had a heat-treated vermicompost um, inoculant, which was a liquid broth created from twice autoclaved vermicompost, which was to kind of control for the effects of uh, nutrients from the vermicompost. And then we had a control treatment, um, which was just a sterilized microbial growth broth. Um, so it didn't receive any sort of microbial community. Um, and so we treated the plants with these inoculants and then we grew the plants to maturity in a greenhouse. And then um, along the way recorded plant phenotypes, including above ground biomass production, foliar nitrogen content and seed yield or um, fruit yield. Um, and we also looked at um, microbiome composition um, to try to compare microbial community composition between these three treatments. Um, and we also did some foliar and fruit um, transcriptomics to look at what the effect of these treatments were on tomato gene expression. And so I'll start off by talking about our microbial data in this experiment. So here we have another ordination comparing rhizosphere microbial communities between our three different treatments. Um, so here we're looking at the effect of treatment on microbial composition. And we have our three treatments represented by these different colors. We have the vermicompost treatment in red, the heat treated vermicompost treatment in blue, and the control treatment in green. And what you can see here is that despite there being a pretty large amount of variability in the data, there do seem to be these three sort of loose clusters forming amongst uh, the three treatment groups, um, which suggests that there are significant effects of treatment on microbial composition, um, which we again verified quantitatively um, with the Permanova, um, which you can see on the upper right hand side. And so what this is showing us is that through our inoculation method, we cultivated these unique microbial communities um, in these three treatments in the greenhouse, which is great. That's what we wanted. And so we hypothesized that if we cultivated these unique microbial communities, we would see some differences in tomato plant phenotype. 
More specifically, we hypothesized that we would see enhanced uh, productivity in my, uh, tomato plants that were grown with the vermicompost microbiomes. Uh, but what was really interesting was that when we looked at um, our plant phenotype data, we didn't see the sort of effects that we were hypothesizing at all. Um, and in fact, most tomato plant phenotypes actually remained unchanged. Um, so here uh, we have total above ground biomass production, foliar nitrogen content, and fruit size. Um, you can see that there is an effective treatment on above ground biomass production, um, and it seems to increase in the vermicompost and heat treated vermicompost treatments. And then when we looked at foliar delta N15 values, which is a proxy for soil nitrogen, and cycling, um, we saw that it was um, significantly different between all three treatments, and foliar delta N15 was actually the highest in the heat treated vermicompost treatment. So this kind of had us scratching our heads because, again, this was not at all what we were expecting. Um, but what was really interesting was when we did our transcriptomic profiling, that's when we sort of started to see um, the um, patterns that we were hypothesizing. So here I have our transcriptome, our foliar transcriptome um, for our different tomato plants. And so we have um, here the expression of different uh, key plant nutrient transporters. So we have the expression of copper, nitrate, phosphate, and zinc transporters between our three treatments in this experiment. And you can see that consistently for all of these different nutrient transporters, we get um, upregulation of all of these uh, transporters in the vermicompost treatment compared to um, both control treatments. And in addition to that foliar transcriptome data, we also did some fruit transcriptomics to look at what the effect of these um, different microbial treatments are on fruits. And we saw, um, again, similar patterns sort of emerge. Um, on the left side, we have um, the expression of cell wall protein X77373, which is actually involved in tomato fruit um, disease resistance. And you can see here that the expression of that protein is, again, sig um, significantly upregulated in the vermicompost treatment. And in figure B, we have the expression of chlorophyll AB binding proteins. And you can see that, again, their expression is also upregulated in the vermicompost treatment. And so to put it all together, um, what this experiment shows is that, again, we have unique um, rhizosphere bacterial communities between our three treatments in this experiment. We hypothesized that if we had these unique microbial communities, we would see some differences um, in plant phenotypes. But um, and again, more specifically, we hypothesized that we would see growth promotion um, in the vermicompost treatment, um, but we didn't observe um, those patterns. Um, but what was really interesting, again, was that when we did um, our transcriptomic sequencing, that's when we started to see effects of vermicompost microbiomes. And if it wasn't for our transcriptomic sequencing, we wouldn't have picked up on these sort of growth promoting effects that vermicompost has um, on, on tomato plants. And so um, to go back to that, again, research question of, you know, how do vermicompost microbiomes influence tomato growth and development? What this experiment shows is that vermicompost microbiomes actually confer multiple fitness advantages to tomato plants, including the upregulation of nutrient transporter genes and disease resistance genes. Um, and again, this was all evidenced through our transcriptomic sequencing. Um, and so that's my chapter three work. And so this project is currently um, in preparation for publication in BMC Plant Biology. Um, and so hopefully it'll be out soon if you're interested in reading a little bit more about it. Um, and I wanted to, before I move on, give a special shout out to my undergraduate mentee, um, Michaela Moravec, um, who graduated um, last year um, and got an amazing job um, in Massachusetts. And she's actually gonna be a co-author um, on this paper. So I'm really proud of her for all the work she did here um, and all the amazing things she continues to do. Um, and so that's my chapter three work. And so now I wanted to move on to my fourth and final chapter. Um, so uh, my fourth chapter was again a field-based project that I received funding for from the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability. And in this project, we were interested in looking at the effects of intercropping on soil properties and horticultural production systems. So to give a little bit of background um, for this experiment, um, previous research has shown that enhancing biodiversity in agriculture could promote multiple ecosystem services. Um, and to kind of give an example, I have this figure from Finney and K 2016, where they show that consistently enhancing um, biodiversity in agriculture could promote ecosystem services such as weed suppression, nitrogen retention, and above ground biomass nitrogen production. And so biodiversity has, um, can have these beneficial effects on agricultural systems. And there's multiple ways through which you can sort of impose biodiversity in agriculture. And one of the ways that we were interested in looking at in this experiment was intercropping. 
So intercropping, just to give a definition, is a simple farming method where you grow more than one crop in a field at a time. And um, previous research has shown that intercropping can have um, several beneficial effects on agroecosystems. Uh, more specifically, um, intercropping has been shown to have um, beneficial effects on pest and disease management. And to kind of give an example, I have this data from Solvay et al. 2016, where they show that intercropping onion and lettuce together um, can significantly reduce um, pest pressure um, in uh, agroecosystems. And so, um, so for this project, what we wanted to look at was specifically how intercropping alters soil properties, um, because that's kind of received less attention in the intercropping research. And more specifically, we wanted to look at what the effect of intercropping was on soil chemical and biological properties, um, as well as plant phenotypic outcomes and production outcomes. And so for this experiment, we did a field trial over at Caldwell's Field, um, where we grew tomato plants in one of three different field treatments. So our first treatment was our control treatment, um, where we just monocropped tomatoes. Um, and then we had two intercrop treatments in this experiment. So um, our first intercrop treatment um, consisted of growing a tomato intercropped with tobacco. And the idea there was to see what the effect of intercropping is when we grow tomato with a close solanaceous relative. Um, and then our second intercrop treatment consisted of growing to, uh, tomato with kale. And the idea there was to see what the effect of growing tomato with a more distantly related brassica crop is. And so we cultivated um, these plots and then throughout the growing season recorded um, soil and plant responses to intercrop treatment to look at what the effect of intercropping was on different soil properties um, and in turn on um, plant phenotypic outcomes. And so I'll start off by uh, talking about some of our soil chemical data. So uh, very broadly speaking, when we looked at our soil chemical data, we saw several effects of intercropping on, uh, on soil nutrition, but the pattern sort of shifted um, with each sort of uh, nutrient that we were looking at. So in figure A, we have um, soil nitrate, and you can see that soil nitrate is significantly greater in the tobacco treatment compared to both the monocrop and kale treatment. Um, but when we look at other um, key soil nutrients, such as phosphorus, we, we see sort of different patterns emerge. Um, so you can see um, in figure B that soil phosphorus is significantly greater in the kale treatment compared to the tobacco treatment, while the monocrop treatment, again, doesn't differ between the other two. And so what this data is kind of showing us is that intercropping does have effects on soil chemistry and the abundance of these different key plant nutrients, but it's all dependent on crop combination and what's being cultivated with one another. Um, and so in addition to that soil chemical data, we also um, did some microbial sequencing to look at what the effect was on microbial composition. Um, so here we're looking at the effects of treatment and sampling date on microbial composition. Um, for our sampling dates, we're specifically looking at um, microbial communities at the start of the experiment versus harvest. Um, and it's kind of hard to see in this ordination because there is a pretty large amount of variability um, in the data. But quantitatively, if you looked on the upper right hand side, you can see our permanova. And you can see that there are significant effects of treatment and date on microbial composition, um, but not the interaction between the two. Um, and so what this is showing us is that in addition to altering those different soil chemical properties, um, intercropping also has effects on soil biological properties and um, microbial communities um, in um, agroecosystems. And then, so in addition to looking at all, all of that soil data, we also looked at some plant phenotypic outcomes. Um, so we looked at traits such as above ground biomass production, foliar nitrogen content, and fruit yields. Uh, we didn't see any effective intercropping on above ground biomass production or uh, foliar nitrogen content, but we did see significant effects of intercropping on average tomato fruit yields per plant. Um, and more specifically, you can see here that average tomato fruit yields um, is significantly greater in the tobacco treatment compared to both the monocrop and kale treatments. So what that's suggesting is that through um, intercropping tomato with tobacco, um, we can get enhancement in yields. And that may be, again, due to some of the shifts in soil properties that we were seeing. And so to summarize and put um, all the data together, um, again, what our uh, experiment shows is that changes in soil chemical properties um, in plant nutrition um, are dependent on what um, crops are being intercropped with one another. Um, soil bacterial communities um, in this experiment, again, shifted in response to intercrop treatment, showing that intercropping can shift microbial taxonomic composition. Um, and also shifts in soil properties could have resulted, again, in the shifts in tomato fruit yields that we were seeing. 
Um, and so this data is really um, exciting because it shows that intercropping, um, again, kind of going back to um, that uh, brief kind of introduction that I gave for this experiment, um, it shows that intercropping can promote multiple ecosystem services in agriculture. Um, for example, in the tobacco treatment, you know, we saw um, enhanced nitrate um, and uh, fruit yield. And so to go back to, you know, that central research question of how does intercropping alter soil properties, um, again, this experiment shows that intercropping alters different soil chemical and biological properties properties, but again, it's all dependent on what's being cultivated with one another. And so uh, with that, that kind of wraps up um, my dissertation discussion. And so with the last couple minutes that I have for my presentation time slot today, um, I wanted to talk just very briefly about some of the other things that I've been involved with as a graduate student um, and also my future plans and how, again, it kind of all comes together to sort of inform my goals going forward. Um, so in addition to, you know, my, uh, my research work and my lab work and stuff, I've also been involved um, with various um, campus organizations. Um, so pictured here, I have um, the Latinx Graduate Student Coalition. And as an executive board member of LGSC for two years, I actually had the opportunity to um, put together and facilitate a variety of programming um, meant to support um, uh, marginalized students on campus, um, which was a lot of fun. And I really cherish all those memories and connections I got to make through that work. Um, in addition to uh, my campus leadership, I've also been involved with teaching and pedagogical training on campus. So um, as Jenny discussed in my introduction, um, some of my teaching highlights include serving as a Camp Pathology TA for the prison education program and also um, teaching my own class on scientific writing um, to first years on campus, um, which were both a lot of fun and um, really sort of deepened my passion for STEM education. Um, and in addition to my teaching work, I've also been involved with pedagogical training on campus. And this was mainly through um, the Cornell Center for Teaching Innovation. So as a CTI fellow, um, I've had the opportunity to put together a variety of programming meant to foster um, inclusion and innovation and teaching um, and I put together um, a bunch of different trainings and programs for graduate and postdoctoral instructors on campus um, which again um, has all been really great and has um, really sort of again deepened my um, appreciation for and passion for education um, and in addition to all that campus, um, all my campus work, I've also been involved um, with different organizations off campus. So here I have um, a picture from last summer um, where I got the opportunity to co-facilitate a community gardening and climate education summer camp um, for kids in Ithaca's West Village. Um, and this was through um, Black Hands Universal. And so here um, in this snapshot, uh, this was kind of like a snapshot of uh, our planting workshop. So I got to teach the kids about things like, um, you know, planting and um, that type of stuff and we got to do some like decorating around the garden and everything um which was a lot of fun and um yeah and so i think you know through all of these different sort of um experiences i really you know developed a strong sort of passion for and um appreciation for um you know community collaboration camaraderie um all that stuff and so going forward what my goal is is to kind of sort of integrate all of that a little bit more into my research and so that brings me to um, my postdoctoral plans. So as Jenny uh, mentioned in my introduction, um, this fall, I'll be heading back to um, sunnier days at UC Davis. <laughs> um, and yeah, at Davis, I'll be joining the labs of Dr. Christina Lescano and Dr. Malika Noko. Um, and we're going to be working, I'll be taking the lead on a big um, field-based project in the California Central Valley, where I'm going to be working with um, farmers of color to look at how climate smart management practices influence drought, fertility, and structural resiliency in almond orchards. Um, more specifically, we're going to be looking at what the effects of cover cropping and climate smart irrigation practices are on almond root ecophysiology and um, as well as uh, different aspects of soil health, such as microbial community composition, um, soil carbon sequestration, um, and all of those different sort of um, uh, properties. Um, and so I'm really excited for my postdoc work. Um, and yeah, and so with that, um, I just wanted to end by saying thank you all once again um, for uh, not only, I guess, coming to my talk, but for, um, yeah, such a great, you know, graduate school experience and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm really going to miss Cornell and, um, yeah, I'm really going to miss everyone. And so I um, hope that, you know, we can all stay in touch. And um, with that, um, in the last few minutes, um, I'll take any questions or anything that you all have. Um, Fun questions are welcome too um, if you want to ask me non research stuff. Um, so, thank you all. Um, and yeah. Any questions?
Question. Hey, Josh, great job. And I'm really super excited to hear that you're going to start working in orchard systems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so in your work, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit um, like mechanistically what might be happening in the soils with the microbial communities. Did you do any um, sequencing and look at specific taxonomic groups? Are you looking, you know, is it like uh, specific organisms or groups of organisms in yeah. the soil that are really starting to show their effect on increasing things like you looked at, like biomass of, of plants. Right, yeah. So um, yeah, so we did look at those things in my different projects. Um, for example, in chapter two, um, again, that multi-generation growth chamber experiment where we saw um, changes in brass carapa productivity. Um, we did look at microbial community composition or taxonomic abundances um, and look at how um, generate, we looked at how generation and selection treatment altered abundances of different um, bacterial families that are associated with growth promotion. Um, so we looked at the abundances of oxalobacteria, which are involved with um, nitrogen cycling, um, which we saw um, was uh, their abundances were significantly greater in the high biomass selection treatment. So again, that may help us explain some of the differences that we were seeing. Um, and so yeah, to answer your question, yeah, we did look at you know microbial abundances and stuff. I didn't really have time to present it in this um, you know presentation, but yeah, we saw um, in all three experiments really changes in the abundances of different um, beneficial microbes in the rhizosphere that again may help us explain some of those phenotypic differences we were seeing um and yeah yeah that, that will be really interesting to look at that I'm yeah excited to read your papers um maybe with that too in the apple world and probably other crops too there's a lot of microbial stimulants that are being sold right. sometimes even like you know this has a certain speed of microbes yeah. in it and things <laughs> like that um what are your thoughts on that you think there's there's is it is it is it uh, uh snake oil or is it is there some benefit to these products that are being sold millions of dollars worth of products. Yeah, um, so I guess I want to say that it's like context dependent, like, I don't know, I guess like, yeah, like, you know, you think about the research, like the research with like those microbial inoculants and everything, a lot of it is like done in like the greenhouse and stuff, so which obviously doesn't necessarily really scale up to like field settings. Um, so I guess like, I don't know, controlled environments, like what Neil is doing and stuff like that, maybe like, you know, those microbial inoculants may be especially useful, but in terms of like fields, stuff, I guess maybe like more, I would say more research is needed there. Um, but uh, yeah. In the back there, yeah. Hi, Josh, um, amazing job. I really am a super huge fan of your work. Um, I have a couple of questions. First is about chapter two, the ELSA network analysis. I was yeah. wondering like the, the tightness of the network that was in the um, higher biomass treatment, like what does that distance represent? Yeah, so what you were seeing um, in that interaction network was, um, so all of the different lines were basically representing in interactions between members of the microbial community. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you'll remember um, in the high biomass selection treatment, we saw more um, connections and lines between all of those different members of the microbial community. And so what that's suggesting is that um, through our selection treatment, we um, promoted interactions um, in the microbial communities of that specific selection line, um, which again may help us explain some of those differences in plant phenotype that we were seeing. Um, again, if um, those microbes are coordinating some sort of activity, like the production of nitrogen cycling enzymes or something, that may help us, you know, again, explain some of those differences in plant phenotype that we were seeing. Oh, I see. So it's like the interactions were just clustered more so amongst certain bacterial groups. Right, yeah. So there was basically just more interactions amongst microbial members um, in the high biomass selection treatment. Okay. And yeah. I had a question, question about that one. Can I... Oh, okay. that. That's some of the chat too. So maybe one more and then we got to go to chat. Okay. Okay. I just had a follow up to the, the networking. Was that an, a specific analysis you did like before doing the stats or was that a statistical analysis? Yeah, so that was, uh, I guess, yeah, so what you're the graphs that you were seeing was um, what came after doing the statistics. So what ELSA does is it basically quantifies microbial interact. It uses um, microbial co-occurrence data to sort of infer relationships and interactions amongst community members. Um, so what we did was we quantitatively took those different sort of like scores, and then we made um, the graphs that you were seeing. Cool. Thanks. I interrupt Alexia on another one. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, my other question was a theme that came up throughout, like 
multiple of your studies is that like the changes in soil properties and microbial communities couldn't always be phenotypically observed. Right. Um, and so like aside from seed production and fruit yield, what are some of the ways that farmers can measure the beneficial effects of, of like changing soil properties? Right, yeah. So I think some of the other ways are maybe outside of the plant. So like in my postdoc work, we're going to be looking at the effect of these different management practices on like soil carbon sequestration and stuff. So maybe that could be some other ways in which farmers can kind of pick up on these differences. Um, I also think, um, I guess just off the top of my head and stuff, thinking about my transcriptomic data, um, I mean, I know like a farmer's not going to like, you know, do RNA sequencing, but I guess that could be another way through which, you know, you can look at these sort of like effects. Um, and again, as like my transcriptome, uh, my transcriptomic sequence sequencing showed, um, yeah, we wouldn't have picked up on those effects if it wasn't for, you know, that sequencing. So, um, yeah, I guess that could be kind of another way through which to look at the effects of microbiomes, but yeah. Okay, so if, if you are online in Zoom and you had a question, can you just unmute and, and give it to Josh, please? Sure. Hi, Josh. Thank you for your research. Um, I was just wondering, and this has kind of already been addressed, but your um, chapter two research was done in a uh, greenhouse. And I wondered to what extent you think those relationships would be able to transfer if you were doing it in a field experiment. Right, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, in terms of uh, doing it in like a field setting, I'm not sure if like selecting for microbes would maybe happen in the same way. Like, I don't know if we can, make a big microbial inoculate or something from uh um for like a field setting but i think uh like uh i guess like I, i've thought about it like ever since you know we did that experiment and stuff and i guess like yeah if someone were to ask me like how does that apply to like field settings i guess like i'm thinking like management practices so maybe you know we're not gonna like take soils from, you know, plants that have enhanced biomass production and inoculated into a new host in the field. But what we can do is um, basically uh, sort of enrich the rhizosphere and soils in these different sort of field settings for um, uh, these growth promoting bacteria uh, through management practices. Um, so yeah, I guess like in the field, I guess like what the experiment shows is that, um, you know, again, my, these microbial communities can be um, manipulated to sort of, um, uh, uh, leads to changes in plant phenotype, and maybe in the field, um, uh, one of the ways in which we can do that is through management practices. Right. Okay. We are out of time. If you want to stick around, um, I, do you have time to stick around? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, please, let's give them a big round. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.